tonight on Under Investigation. Countless bullets shot in 23rd gangland killing. First, it was Melbourne's gangland war. One of the bloodiest legacies in Australia's criminal history. Now, war has come to Sydney. There's an addiction of bloodlust out there. You've shot three of mine, I'm going to shoot three of yours. Killing after killing. This is an automatic weapon effectively fired from a car. On the city streets. Their orders are, I want them dead, I want them dead now. Tonight we go inside the gangs of Sydney. The two warring crime families and the terrifying rise of the postcode gangs. They've got a constant supply of young people to do their dirty work. Teenage thugs who are not afraid to kill them. They are the future, they're their muscle. Will they add their firepower to this already explosive war? It puts a chill down my spine. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, four experts to help make sense of the seemingly senseless killings. Some who've experienced the bloodshed and its impact firsthand. It's like a Hollywood film. It is. It's one of the bloodiest wars being fought very publicly out there on the streets and it doesn't seem to be stopping. Yeah, get out of the way. Get out of the way. We came to play. Mark Morrie, crime editor with the Sydney Daily Telegraph, brings his inside knowledge of this war. They're just shooting really nearly, like literally, wherever they see somebody that, from an opposing faction or finding out where they are, they're killing them and it doesn't matter where they are. Over the years, we've seen numerous feuds and, and gang members having uh, shootouts, whether it's bikies or crime gangs. Former New South Wales Detective Superintendent Deborah Wallace headed up Strike Force Raptor, targeting criminal gangs and crime family networks. This, to me, seems more dangerous because of their willingness to, to shoot on sight, not caring about where they are or the consequences of who they may be shooting. Psychologist Dr Rose Cantali works with at-risk youth in Sydney's southwest, the epicentre of the gang violence. Rose, uh, the psychology yeah. that we're seeing on the streets here, what's, yeah. what's well, happening? Well, I'm seeing a lot of younger people coming into gangs, which makes them quite strong because they're able to do a lot of illegal activities that normally they wouldn't be able to get away with. I think it's also that rock and roll lifestyle, you know, the want to die before I get old. Organised crime specialist Mark Locks fears the new youth gangs are taking their lead from the chaos and brazen savagery of those fighting Sydney's gangland wars. We had quite a few people who were warned by the police that they had contracts out on them. They still went out there. Why? Because that's the life I'm leading. I can't be seen to back down. But I also don't think I'm going to live to be 30, so I've got to die sometime. I'm going to go out as a man. Australia has a bloody history of gangland killings and gang wars. In the 1920s, the Razor Gangs dominated the Sydney crime scene, so called for their weapon of choice as they viciously battle for control over the underworld. Attempted murder, malicious wounding. More recently, in the 1980s and 90s, it was the Vietnamese 5T Gang who controlled the heroin trade in Western Sydney's Cabramatta and Bankstown. And in Melbourne, the infamous gangland war portrayed in Underbelly, which claimed 36 lives. A football oval crowded with children, metres away, two men shot dead as they sat in the front seat of this van. Gangsters like Carl Williams and Jason Moran, killers who were then killed themselves. For gang members, it's all about identity, mutual protection and status, but mostly drugs, women and money. Is that overstating it, Mark? No, no, it's money and everything that comes with it. And I think it's highlighted by some of these guys actually living it out on social media. I'm showing this is how much money I have. But the amount of money being made now is astronomical. So it's and massive money to be made from drugs. Yeah. Is that the root of the evil, Deborah? I think drugs underpins most of what they're doing. So drugs and territory is certainly important because that's their business model. And where the business model for the drug trade was once heroin, what's fueling this war now 
is cocaine, the middle-class drug of choice for over 100,000 Australians, the highest per capita use anywhere in the world. It's become a very cool drug. Heroin was seen as the dirty drug, I Absolutely. guess. You're telling me it's horror stories in Cabramatta of finding, you know, people, they were dying. Whereas with the cocaine, you know, we refer to it as a party drug. 66 kilograms, $24 million worth of drug deals. According to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, cocaine is a $5 billion a year industry. And we're literally paying for it through the nose. A kilo of cocaine here costs $350,000 to $400,000, compared to $40,000 in Europe and $1,000 in South America. What's driving that appetite? When I was a teenager, very, very long ago, no one knew about cocaine other than watching Scarface on the movies. Now I can go to my local bar and the barman will tell me he bought cocaine last week. So it's gone from a very elite drug down to a drug used by a lot of normal, everyday people. So it's acceptable? It's acceptable. Australia's drug trade is controlled by organised crime groups, from the Italian Mafia, Mexican cartels and outlaw motorcycle gangs like the Comancheros. But on the streets of Sydney, it's two crime family networks, the Humsies and the Alamedines, and it's their bloody war we're investigating tonight. So who are the Humsies and Alamedines? The Humsies have been on the police radar since the mid-1990s, back when family patriarch Khaled Humsey was jailed for drug offences. Khaled died in 2020. The clan's crime boss has been Khaled's son, Bassam, who is currently in prison for a string of offences, including drugs and murder. Police allege Bassam maintained control of the clan from behind bars through his brother on the outside, Majid Hamzi. Then there's the Alamedines, who maintain strong associations with the Comanchero biker gang. In 2015, the godfather, Talal Alamedine, was jailed for 17 years for supplying the gun that killed police accountant Curtis Cheng. Police have alleged the clan's current boss is Talal's brother, Rafat Alamadeen. The Hamzies have been around, as, as you said, Liz, a, a long time. The Almadines were nothing but foot soldiers. Police were once again turning over the home of the Alamadeen family. But the crime network controlled by the Alamadeen family is now on the rise. Police arrested two other members during 13 raids this morning, seizing several guns and stolen cars. Rose, are they happy to be tagged as organised crime families? Yeah, I think the notorious um, label is quite good and it's very positive for them because they feel it's part of the power, it's part of the prestige and their structure is very united and, that, and that's what makes them so successful because of the network. And it's a cultural thing too, you know, and family is very, very important and you don't snitch on your family. You... But, but is everybody in the family happy to Absol be labelled this organised crime family? Well, I mean, I don't think they see it as an organ. They try. They, I think predominantly it's money. It's business. It's money. But and it's I, an illegal business. They know it's illegal, but they make the most of it because they take advantage of. You know, this is what my family does, and you don't question whether something is legal or not. It's a family thing. For years, the Humsey clan has been in a bloody feud with the Alamedines. No one's sure how the war began. Some say their conflict started in Lebanon. But we do know there was this vicious prison brawl in 2018 between Bassam Hamzi and Talal Alamedin inside Goulburn's Supermax prison. A savage attack that swiftly seemed to escalate out of control. Did it become about drugs and then just become personal? Yeah, I, exactly. That's, that's how this war has really started. It's like a movie. Some of these are like old-fashioned gangster, I'm going to kill that guy. But the underlying is the fact that they're going to take out a competitor for the drug business. So that's a side benefit. 
I don't know whether the revenge is a side benefit or the money's a side benefit. Vendetta is a very important in, in gang mentality. If they don't kill someone and if they don't do something about it, well, how does it make them look in front of everyone else? They've lost their, their face. I think what everyone agrees is that it starts off with, with the drugs, you know, I want your territory, so... But it can be as simple as, you've shot through mine, I'm going to shoot through yours. And that's where it never ends. Coming up... It's an order of shoot on sight. We'll reveal what turned this family feud... This is a big hit. It's huge. ...into a full-blown gang war on the streets of Sydney. They'll be looking for revenge. Do they care that they've killed a bystander? I don't think they care. They go, oh, we missed him. Three for the three. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we're investigating Sydney's deadly gang war that has so far claimed up to a dozen lives and counting. At its core, two crime families battling over turf, drugs and a personal vendetta. The feud between the Humzies and the Almadines was simmering for years, but in August 2020, it boils over. The reason? Apparently because 400 kilograms of cocaine disappears from a Sydney warehouse. The estimated value, $100 million. The stash allegedly belonged to the Comancheros outlaw motorcycle gang, one of several organised crime groups involved in the large-scale importation of drugs into Australia. It's alleged the Comanchero's distributor and muscle in Western Sydney is the Alamedine crime family network. Well, this war we're having here now is the culmination of the Alamedines now working with the Comanchero. Mark Morrie knows the underworld. His sources tell him reprisals for the drug's rip-off are swift and brutal punched and kicked before being picked up and thrown into the back of a stolen Mercedes SUV. There was a lot of kidnappings, kidnappings that obviously aren't reported to the police because they're guys that may have had it and they were tortured to try and find out where and who took it. It's alleged by police the Alamedines seized the opportunity to take down their rivals, the Humsey clan. And on October 19th, 2020, a brazen killing sparks a bloody escalation. Two killers in black run towards their target and take aim. The man known as the King of the Hamzis, Majid Hamzi, is gunned down in broad daylight outside his home. The 44-year-old was peppered with bullets as he left his Condell Park home yesterday morning. Majid was the brother of jailed Humsey family overlord, Bassam Humsey. This is a big hit. It's huge to hit somebody of the significance of mentioned himself believed to be involved in, in killing people. Big player in the drug world. It's a declaration of war in many ways. What happens inside a family when that happens? They'll be thinking about, we've got to get revenge. That's the instant reaction, it is isn't instant, it? But also... Would you agree? The, absolutely. They'll be looking for revenge, not just because of their position in the crime world, but also because we've, we're back to vendetta and family again. When we hear about Medjid Hamzy and then find out how big he is, how important he is, that's when you think, gee, what's going to happen next? As the Humsey family mourns Majid's death, this very public feud is about to turn into a bloodbath. And the fear is it's only a matter of time until an innocent bystander is caught in the crossfire. In January 2021, 29-year-old father-to-be Mustafa Naman is shot. It's a tragic case of mistaken identity. The gunfire erupted in a council car park just after 11 last night. Mustafa was publicly gunned down after leaving a boxing match with friends. Tragically, he was in a near-identical car to that owned by Ibrahim Humzi, a senior member of the Humzi clan who'd left the same boxing match shortly before the shooting. As with so many scenes in this bloody war, the shooting is captured on video. 
And so too is the immediate aftermath. You breathing, Carlos? Yeah, it's breathing. So what's that you're going to make that up in flash? Breathe, Bobo, breathe. Despite pleas from Mustafa's friends and family to hold on, the 29-year-old father-to-be does not survive. The first innocent bystander killed in this bloody gangland war. A young guy is going to the boxing. He has the horrible misfortune of looking like Ibi Hamzi, compounded by getting into a car that was similarly driven by Ibi Hamzi, who had left 20, 30 minutes earlier. And that's quick organisation, you oh, said. Yeah, speed. And that's a hallmark of a, a lot of what was going on. And I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how, how quickly they mobilised mm. and they got the wrong yes. right. Well, if they're organising this quickly, this is not professional hits. Because okay. that takes some planning. It takes some planning. Associate Professor Mark Locks is well versed in underworld assassinations. You've got to go and literally surveil people and work out what their timelines are and make sure they're going to be in the right place at the right time and that you're ready to do it. So... This is not what's going on here. This is very, very reactive. It's very, very opportunistic. They've got him when he's got in his car. They've run over it. They've done it in his face to make sure he's dead. This is not the work of professional hitmen in the organised crime community. Here, it's an order of shoot on sight. Do you, do you think they did? Totally. The fact that they're so, in a way, unsophisticated, reckless, makes them so much more dangerous. Um, give them a gun and give them a rush of blood and give them an order, they'll just go out and, and, and do it. I think also they're impulsive. So part of the impulsive nature is to respond in an impulsive manner. They've got a job to do, they do it, they don't care how they do it, they don't care how sloppy they are. They are off. We missed him. They missed him, yeah. but oh. do they care that they've killed a bystander? Only, Somebody. I think only it, about the heat it would bring on. I, I think they're, they're that cold-blooded. It, it, it'll be about themselves. Oh no! Oh no! They're going to get in trouble for whoever's paid them. <laughs> so that they've taken, they've got the wrong person. Coming up, a drive-by shooting in Leppington, piercing a hospital window. No one is safe. They've sprayed these bullets at a gym. Not even toddlers. And they've gone into a childcare centre. In a war now joined by youth gangs. It's a postcode war. Bringing their violence into public places. Suddenly, the streets have been brought into something that we keep safe. That's next on Under Investigation. We're investigating the brutal and public gang war being arrogantly fought on Sydney streets with no respect for innocent lives. The body count is rising in the battle between rival crime families, the Humsies and the Alamedines. Now that the Humsey godfather, Majid, has been killed, this war is about to get out of control. With Majid Hamzi dead, Bilal Hamzi becomes the new head of the family. Trying to stop the war, Bilal allegedly sits down with a rival from the Alamedin family to negotiate a truce. There was a meeting, allegedly, where there was talk of peace and he walked away from that thinking that maybe there'd be some calm but not total peace. But he's wrong. Police later warn Bilal he's also now a target. He relocates to inner city Sydney, but not even his safe house will keep him alive. A bitter and bloody feud spills into the heart of Sydney CBD. On the 17th of June last year, at 10.25pm, Bilal Humzi is gunned down after leaving an exclusive restaurant in what police allege is one of this war's most public executions. He has uh, openly seen you have nailed multiple guns off. That's New York style mafia here. To crime editor Mark Murray, what's alleged to have unfolded that night was perhaps the underworld at its most ruthless. He's there with a woman, not his wife. He's just walking, she's a few feet behind. He gets to about here when the car comes tearing down on the other side of Bridge Street, pumps a few bullets into him. He hits the ground. It miraculous does a U-turn while he's laying in the gutter, puts more bullets into it. Then takes off up Bridge Street, winds its way onto the Harbour Bridge and then 
makes its getaway. We're starting to see the, the hams is almost picked off. Within the New South Wales police force, Deborah Wallace was known as the gangbuster. The killing of Bilal Humsey, she says, was a stark and defiant hit. Deborah, this should be called a public execution. Yeah, I think it did look more planned. It you know, got wait for him outside in a public place. I think it was much more controllable than, say, some of the previous ones. Yeah, they knew where he was. Yeah. They knew he was coming out. I still want to know how they knew he was going to be at that restaurant. There's a talk that they had monitored uh, trackers on his car, followed him to that safe house and then followed him through the streets. Or was there another way they found him? You said that you'd never seen anything quite like this. Not in, not in the streets of Sydney like that, so publicly. And then to do a U-turn, come back and shoot him again while he's laying in the ground with people on the sidewalk just going. That is straight out bravado. I mean, that is not, once again, we're back to this isn't professionalism. To come back and shoot again is, look at me, look what I can do. I am showing off. Um, big noting myself when I've done it. Um, a, a professional is going to do the hit, get in the car, drive away, burn the car, get in another car, disappear, never be known. Rose, how do you view these public executions? Oh, I think um, they're brazen, obviously. They're very brazen. To Dr Rose Cantali, the psychology is clear. The fact is that they don't, really don't care about people around them. They, it doesn't really worry them. They know no one's, everyone's going to be so shocked. It's as if they have a psychology degree. They really understand how people are going to respond, and that's what, by doing absolutely nothing. Then, in August last year, the Alamedines body count rises. When their associate, Shady Kanj, dies in a hail of bullets. The riot squad brought in as emotions ran raw. One of those bullets grazes the forehead of Rama Osman, who's innocently sitting in his car 250 metres away. Centimetre either way and you would have been dead. I've been dead, yeah. What follows is a rapid succession of killings. A drive-by shooting at Leppington. Endangering more innocent lives. A car peppered with gunshots in Guildford. As streets, parks and unbelievably even a hospital. A stray bullet piercing a hospital window. A nurse left with minor injuries. Become battle zones. Dead on a Greenacre Street. In this firing frenzy, four members of the Humsey clan meet their deaths. But on Monday, November 29th last year, the most chilling attack of them all. As this extraordinary CCTV footage reveals, four men are walking to a gym in Sydney's west, when suddenly there's a rapid firing of bullets from a car. One of the men is hit, allegedly a member of the Alamedine clan. He will survive. CCTV footage shows the true horror of this shooting. Next door to the gym is a daycare full of children. Two toddlers are playing with a childcare worker when bullets spray through the wall. That childcare centre shooting is something else. It is. It still sticks in my mind, you know. They've sprayed these bullets at a gym and they've gone into a childcare centre. They have missed these kids by millimetres. You can see it. You can see the holes in the wall. Then comes an attack the Sydney underworld can scarcely believe. The target, Tarek Zahid, is alleged to be one of Australia's most powerful organised crime figures. Sergeant at arms of the Comancheros motorcycle gang and an ally of the Alamedines. If he was concerned for his well being, he didn't show it. Publicly, Tarek flaunted his wealth. Just sit in the nearest seat, thank you. And confidently attended big events, including the Australian Tennis Open. But on May the 10th this year, Tarek and his brother Omar are riddled with bullets in the foyer of a gym in Sydney's West. Omar, who is also a notorious figure, dies at the scene. Tarek is shot 10 times, but incredibly survives. 
How do you describe this moment? Oh, boy, that was, that was brutal. And, and for him to survive, Tarek would have said, oh, well, no one will take me, especially at the gym. There's that arrogance again. I'm untouchable. He had another level of protection too because the bikey culture is still there. Associate Professor Mark Locks is an expert on outlaw motorcycle gangs. The moment you've hit a member of a club, yeah. everybody in the club now owes that responsibility to respond. Yeah. And they're a very big international club. So it's going to be extremely hard to hide from the Comanchero. Yeah. The Comancheros are a dark force in Sydney's gang war. Police have called them Australia's largest criminal organisation, involved in huge drug importations. But they are also allegedly supporters of the Alamedines in their bloody battle against the Humsies. Striking directly against the Comanchero Sergeant at Arms, Tarek Zahed, has now escalated this war to a new and even more deadly level. It stunned the underworld to, to do that because you're taking out, not a club, but the, one of the highest ranking guys in this club. They didn't Rock. take him out? No, <laughs> no so, they didn't. So but what's they took the his fallout brother. of that? Well, well, three days later, there is a young man shot dead believed to have been involved. Now, at the time, Tarek is basically in a coma, but the club took care of business. And so it was, just days after the attack on Tarek and Omar. The man some have speculated orchestrated the hit, Rami Askander, is himself killed, gunned down in the driveway of his home. Go, go, go. In the midst of the carnage, New South Wales police are fighting back, police, trying to contain and control this gang war. They've seized millions in drugs and cash, dozens of firearms and made hundreds of arrests, including Tarek Zahed himself. <laughs> Having miraculously survived 10 gunshot wounds and not long out of hospital, police snatched him off a busy Sydney street in dramatic fashion. Officers pump non-lethal beanbag pellets into the vehicle to secure his arrest. But police know they're engaged in a war where the few rules that once applied are about to change. There used to be an unwritten law with the criminal element, especially in organised crime, that you, you know you don't touch family, you don't touch women. I think that rule of engagement and that law book's been thrown out the window. August 13th. It's a peaceful Saturday night in Reevesby in Sydney's southwest. Mother of two, Lametta Fadlala, and her friend, hairdresser Amy Al Hazuri, are heading out to dinner. At the wheel of the car, a young man, and beside him, a 16 year old girl. All of a sudden, it looks like you know, a couple of gunmen have come across and just tapped on the window and then just sprayed bullets into the back of the car. <laughs> It's just a trademark underworld hit. Reports suggest Lametta Fadlala is herself an underworld figure with ties to the Alamedines and the Comancheros. One guy said to me, she was told the week before, you better be careful. And she said, no, I'm OK, don't worry. They're not going to kill a woman. Amy, Amy, hi. But her friend, Amy al Hazuri becomes another innocent bystander lost to this bloody war. That just shows you that they don't care. They're reckless, they're inexperienced. Their orders are, I want them dead, I want them dead now. And these guys just go and kill. Coming up, as the battle rages... Message of violence, message of killing over territory, message of we don't respect the authority. Copycat youth gangs are joining the war. They will carry the guns, they'll do the drug running, they do all the dirty work. Their attacks, public and indiscriminate. It's the normal now. Everyone's carrying a knife. That puts a chill down my spine. That's next on Under Investigation. Australia. 
Australia has been shocked by the gang war spiralling out of control in Sydney. Sydney is more violent than I've known it to be. Incredibly violent uh, to another level. As our investigation tonight has shown, its scale and its viciousness are scarcely believed. Gangster Bilal Hamzi shot at least five times. Opened fire into the back seat of a car. Residents reeling after a double murder. Raging across suburban streets. The gunfire erupted in a council car park just after 11 last night. Caught in the crossfire, men and women. Hairdresser and innocent passenger Amy al Hazuri lost her life. Even toddlers in a childcare centre. They've sprayed these bullets at a gym. They have missed these kids by millimetres. So far, more than a dozen killings and rising. Their willingness to shoot on sight, not caring about where they are or the consequences of who they may be shooting. At its bloody core, a battle between rival crime families, the Humzies and the Alamedines. But our investigation reveals an even greater threat as a new generation joins the gangland war. Ruthless and brutal youths, members of the so-called postcode gangs. We're seeing an escalation and a very uh, strong escalation within our community, especially in Western Sydney. Oase Menzel is a teenager in Sydney's West who's very aware and concerned about the violence of postcode gangs. There's been so many instances where, um, you know, members of the public, innocent bystanders, uh, are caught in the crossfire. So uh, there's a sense of fear. They march under their postcodes, such as 21, 67 and 27. Emboldened by the chaos and bloodshed erupting on Sydney streets, with members as young as 12. They're highly territorial and not afraid to kill. They're just a bunch of youth who are just running amok on the streets, but it's getting to a point where it's no longer running amok, it's killing. For Oase, it's become very personal. My close friend was walking streets, as any young person would, not expecting that his life will be taken away from him. Last year, his friend Jason Galligan was beaten to death. He wasn't affiliated with any gangs. Um, he wasn't a bad person, you know, never had a criminal history, and he, he just, you know, in the wrong place, wrong friends in the wrong time. So far, seven people have been charged over the incident. Six of them are aged between 13 and 19. Even as he was dying, his teenage attackers allegedly forced him to renounce his postcode. They're very territorial. They care about their territory um, and they'll fight till, till the end to make sure that they defend that territory. The brazen brutality of the war between the Humzies and the Alamedines is mirrored by the postcode gangs. And across social media, youths record and glorify their violence and savagery. I ain't me over no hold. This Doonside teenager, postcode 67, is dragged out of a store by members of the 27 gang from Mount Druitt and brutally assaulted. The victim mocked the attack posted on social media. It's a postcode war, and now the cone of silence, just like a bikey club, is stopping the perpetrators from being caught. That's concerning because even the word postcode, what does it tell you? It actually encourages people to go out and, jo and, 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 and replicate those gangs anywhere. This is the future, isn't it? It's the future and it's the past because these gangs have always fought. If we went back through our Australian history, we've always had every new group of people who've come to Australia, the youth, the boys have formed gangs. And that's universal around the world. What is new is the music is now um, glorifying 
the lifestyle. It's called drill music, and it's often played as a call to war. Police consider some of these rappers such a threat that they have been barred from performing live. Three members of the group 1-4 were jailed for this brutal assault. Always, uh, they have their own soundtrack. Oh, yeah. What's the message? Uh, message of violence, message of killing over territory, message of, you know, we don't respect the authority. You know, they look at police like they're out to get them, um, like enemies. They don't respect the people um, that are supposed to enforce the law because they're enforcing it in a way that they feel um, is against them um, and out to get them. In the very brutal Sydney gangland war over drugs and territory, guns are the weapon of choice. And running with them, the postcode gangs are armed too with blades. In this alleyway off Fitzsimmons Street in Parramatta, he was fatally stabbed in the chest. In New South Wales, the latest figures from the Bureau of Statistics are that one in five people charged with assault involving a knife are juveniles. The two critical patients had uh, received multiple stab wounds uh, to their chest and back. A trail of blood and weapons left behind. That puts a chill down my spine. They're not just kids hanging around a railway station. They're kids that are armed with a weapon and they're kids that will have a, a propensity to use that weapon if they want to, if this is real. Sydney's gangland war has seen a number of shocking public executions. But following the death of a 17-year-old boy at Sydney's Easter show this year, the focus moved to postcode gangs and how dangerous they may now be. Something like the Easter show, this is a family event. This is where young people are. Thousands of people flock the Easter show with their families, babies, young children. You know, they're going to have an enjoyable time, but instead um, have to witness a stabbing and live with that for the rest of their lives. One of those charged was only 14 years old at the time. When we start to say it's, a, it's brought into the homes, into mums and dads going, oh my God, I was at this show, one of the safest places. But suddenly the streets have been brought into something that we keep safe. So will the vicious battles being waged between postcodes inevitably merge into those being fought between the Humsies and Alamedines? Youths who believe it's their time to forge alliances and join the greater gangland war. An offshoot of one of the postcode gangs calls themselves KVT, notorious for their violence and brutality. Young, but so hardcore, they've become the ground force for the Alamedine crime clan. They will carry the guns, they'll do the kidnappings, they'll do the drug running, they do all the dirty work. If you were going to do a hit, you need two cars, one to do the shooting from, another one to escape in. You can say, find me two cars. It's crime that's inspired by the leaders of Sydney's gang war and the riches that violence seems to promise. How would the Alamedines and the Hamsies view these postcode kids? How, well, they, they're a feeder group. They are the future. They're their muscle. So th these crime families would like to see this. Is that what we're suggesting? If they've got a, a constant supply of young people that are just starting out to do their dirty work for who are expendable, let me tell you, there's no loyalty. As soon as they get caught, they're cut. Coming up... Fearing the future. It's going to be very dangerous for our future generations because these kids are going to turn into adults soon. How do we stop the postcode youths joining the deadliest gang war of them all? There's an addiction of bloodlust out there. We could all be sitting here right now and come out and there's been another shooting. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we've investigated Sydney's brutal gangland war Be the last one standing. and the terrifying prospect it could get even bigger. There's an addiction of bloodlust out there. 
bloody feud between rival crime clans, the Humzies and the Alamedines. Why are you running for your fucking dog? Threatens to be joined by a new army of ultra-violent youths, the postcode gangs of Sydney's West. Youths as young as 12 who've been recruited to join their criminal networks. They're not just kids hanging around a railway station, they're kids that are armed with a weapon and they're kids that will have a, a propensity to use that weapon if they want to. This is real. We reveal the shocking parallels in this intergenerational war. The public attacks. The brazen kings. They've got the red fury going on and all they're focusing on is that's my target and what, what the peripheral is is irrelevant to me. We've shown how this live fast, die young conflict... I can't be seen to back down, but I also don't think I'm going to live to be 30, so I'm going to go out as a man. ..is grounded in drugs and the millions at stake. It's money and everything that comes with it. The amount of money being made now is astronomical. And Sydney's innocent victims killed senselessly in this vicious street battle being fought without rules or regard. It still sticks in my mind. To see bullets flying, they have missed these kids by millimetres. A war that will seemingly go on in one form or another while the demand for drugs in Australia fuels it. Drugs underpins most of what they're doing. Drugs and territory is certainly important because that's their business model. It's now an environment that worries Western Sydney teenager Owais Menzel. Owais, what's the future look like, do you think? It's an unforeseeable future for us because I feel like this is going to rage on and it's going to be very dangerous for our future generations because these kids um, are going to turn into adults soon and from there we don't know how they'll evolve as gangs. One day they might be one of the top gangs in Sydney, who knows? What I'm concerned about is these postcode gangs, what happens to them when they're picked up by the police and, and, and the process that goes from that. And I think if we had the formula of being able to help these young people, maybe that's where we need to start the ball rolling because these are the future gangs. But for our panel tonight, bikey expert Mark Locks, psychologist Dr Rose Cantali, former New South Wales detective superintendent Deborah Wallace, and veteran crime reporter Mark Morrie, there's a very real fear this Sydney gang war not only won't end anytime soon, but with the rise of postcode gangs, it may well be about to explode. Mark Morrie, where do you think we're at? I think it's a very dangerous point. It's just, it's a never ending cycle. We're moving between families, so we've seen. The Humzies go to jail. The Alamedines, a lot of them are in jail, but not for the long term. So the next family's going to come up. The demand for all the drugs and the other crime hasn't gone away. Somebody's going to supply it. And that next family may be in Western Sydney. It may be one of the uh, already existing in one of the, the postcode gangs. Mm. Does that mean it won't end? I can't say for certain because we literally don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We could all be sitting here right now and come out and there's been another shooting. That is the truth. Mm. And that's the uncertainty and that's the feeling of uncontrolled behaviour. That's why we're frightened. Absolutely. I want to thank you all very much for joining us. Um, a very important conversation to have and I thank you. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night. Next week... It's such a lonely place. Australia's Hitchhiker's Highway. In the mind of a predator, this is a great landscape. In those days, if you get into somebody's car and nobody sees you, you just vanish. In all, the highway has claimed 11 victims, murdered or missing. Like Tony Jones. This was the adventure of a lifetime. Who took a one-way ride into the night and never came back. Put the body in the back of the ute and took it to the slaughter yard. That's the starting point that you're looking for. We find out what really happened. After 30 years of a vacuum, suddenly the story picks up again. That's next week on Under Investigation.